Seville, don't you? Amen. Amen. Doing good work before the Lord. And I was thinking during the singing here, Brother Doug, I, I'd say everybody here is probably pretty familiar with us. Uh, I've, I've been around now for a long time. Back uh, before um, Doug had any gray hair, and back when Brother Seville had some more hair, and uh, back before I had gray hair, and we won't talk about Sister Brim, amen. But uh, we've been coming around a long time. Um, just in the beginning of the service tonight, there's a lot of uh, thoughts were going through my mind coming back here. I miss a lot of people, don't you? Yes. I miss a lot of folks who have been friends for years and years. Yes. And uh, I remember Brother Lucas and his wife. I remember Brother Dietrich and uh, the layman's, just great people that we miss. Yes. And I shouldn't start calling them names because there's so many others that we could call, but I, uh, I'm glad for those that are still here and still Amen. going on for the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Really, we all are going to the same place that Amen. they went to. We're trying to get to heaven. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And so don't be weary because they are not here anymore. It's, uh, it really should be an encouragement for us to make it. Amen. Amen. Praise so, God. Mom passed away a couple years ago now, a few years now. And uh, it does not discourage me from going to heaven, but it makes me want to go just a little bit more. Amen. 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 Let's open our Bibles, and Sister Brim's going to testify here in a minute. But uh, let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation, if you would. Praise God. Revelation. And I'm going to try to preach to you tonight. I've been preaching a series at home on this right here. And I think I've already preached eight messages from this. And I've probably got three more to go. And I'm going to try to give it to you in one service. <laughs> All right? But uh, hopefully we're going to get it done in about 30 minutes or less. That sound good? Amen. So don't, don't fall out with me. Don't leave me. I promise you I'm not going to hold you too long. But uh, I felt this morning, uh, just as soon as I woke up, I felt like this is what the Lord put on my heart to talk to you about. So we're going to do that here for a few minutes tonight in the book of Revelation. Sister Brim, stand and testify. Well, it's certainly good to be here with our family. Yeah. But with y'all as well. And I'm like Tim, I was thinking about, wow, we haven't come around for a long time. And some people are missing, but there's some new people too. That's right. Lots of right. new faces out there, but new faces on this pew. And I'm happy for that. Well, we needed a good wife for a long time, and, and it was worth the wait. Amen. And then his little angels, and on and on and on. But um, I didn't really think about saying anything here tonight, but I was reading a, a few days back now, and um, I knew this was in the Bible, but I forgot about the surrounding story. Sometimes we remember verses that are in the Bible, but we don't always remember the surrounding stories. But I was reading one day, and uh, the book of Acts, and I always tell the kids at church, if you're looking for adventure novels and, yeah. and superheroes, you can find them in the Bible, yeah. not yeah. just in the Old Testament or the New Testament, but all over. And right. Paul's certainly one of those heroes in the Bible. Yes. But this is what he said one day in Acts chapter 26 and verse 2. He said, I think myself happy, King right. Agrippa, because, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. And you say, well, yeah, Paul could say I think myself happy because he was a great man in the Bible. He did all kinds of good things, but to start off with, he wasn't a good man in the Bible. He That's was right. a very bad man in the Bible. That's right. And I have hope for all my little hungry Sunday school boys that Saul <laughs> can turn into Paul one day. And so Saul was, or Paul was doing all these wonderful things. And um, I thought about um, sometimes in life, there's a lot of people that we deal with, pastoring and, and in the community. And man, people spend a lot of time being unhappy. They yes, spend a lot of energy. And children right. don't have happy homes. I tell my mom all the time, we, every day I realize how normal we were. Not that I didn't think we were. <laughs> but every day I realize how normal our family was and that you taught me right from wrong. And, taught me to keep myself clean and to wear clean clothes and all these things and, and, and sometimes it's so sad kids spend a lot of time being unhappy yeah. 
because they are in unhappy situations. Right, right, but yeah. Paul here, he wasn't in a happy situation. When he said this, he had been in prison and jail and bounced around and accused of this and that and accused of things, but never got to give his own interpretation of what he was accused of. And so that's what's going on here in this story in verse chapter, or chapter 26. He finally gets to go to King Agrippa and he's asked about these things that he was accused of. And always remember that the devil doesn't like you. He That's doesn't right. like you when you're a sinner. And That's he sure right. doesn't like you when you try to live for the Lord. Yeah. And anytime you try to live for the Lord, there's going to be people that don't like what That's you do. Right. And right. that doesn't mean you stop doing it. You just keep on doing what you know is right. And that's what Paul was doing. And he was accused of these things. And if he had any right, any person had any right to be unhappy, it would have been Paul yeah. on this day. When he got to King Agrippa, he could have really told him some things. We'll just say it that way. But he didn't get mad. He wasn't aggravated. Not that the Bible records that. That he said, I think myself happy. Yeah. And we can be happy in no matter what situation we're in because... God turned our life around. Right. And so in this this yeah. this time of before the king, instead of being sad or mad or angry or aggravated, he said, I think myself happy. Yeah. And he went on to tell, this day I shall answer for myself. He used it as one more opportunity to preach the gospel. Right. And he right. told about that life-changing moment on the road when Jesus totally turned his life around. Right. He used it for a testimony one more time. And he said, I think myself happy that I shall answer for yeah. myself. Now, I don't normally like to go up and just pick arguments with people. But if somebody asks me, I'm going to tell them. Right. Because it happened to me. God yeah. turned my life around. And yes. he helped me in this way, in this way, in this way. And yeah, the circumstances were bad. I've right. been accused of things that weren't true. I've never even had the chance to try to make it right. Because people don't ask. They just believe the lies. Yeah. And we can say, I'm sad, I'm mad. But I think myself happy. Yeah. That encouraged my heart that yeah. day. When I reread that, I knew that was in the Bible. But I forgot the surrounding story. Right. And I thought, well, if Paul can do it, I can do that. Yeah. Through the help yeah. of Jesus Christ that did turn my life around, I can think myself happy. Yeah. And I can answer for myself because I have had a personal relationship with the Lord. I was taught that growing up. And yeah. I've experienced it. And I know it. And I'm thankful that he does make my soul yeah. happy. Yeah. Amen. 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 I'm happy in Jesus, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Amen. Well, here's something else that's changed. I got glasses, yeah. so uh, yeah. let's let's. Uh, I'll read it all with all four of my eyes, and you read with your eyes tonight. How many of you have ever heard it said, or said it yourself, that there'll be no tears in heaven? You ever heard that said? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna preach to you about it tonight. All right. Let's see what the Bible says about it. Revelation chapter number five, verse number one. If you have it, say Amen. He said, and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And here's the first occurrence of tears in the book of Revelation. And I wept much. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Amen. You can read on down through it. It's a wonderful chapter. I love chapter 5 of Revelation. But notice he said, I wept much. Now, let's go to chapter 7, verse number 17. Chapter 7, verse number 17. And let's find the second occurrence of tears in the book of Revelation. All right? 717, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Praise God. Let's go to Revelation 21, verse number 4. Revelation 21, verse 4. Revelation 21 is when the new heaven and the new earth is being uh, seen by John. And in verse number 4, he said, 
and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So we find three occurrences here of crying or tears in heaven. That's what I want to preach about, is tears in heaven. I know it's been said many times that there are no tears in heaven. And I know that that is very encouraging. It can bring great comfort to hearts that are hurting, people that are going through time of suffering and sorrow, that when we hear that there's not going to be any tears in heaven, it makes it able, it makes us able to bear the tears that we're bearing now a little easier, doesn't it? But when you look at the Word of God, we find that there is tears in heaven. There are tears. If God's going to wipe them away, they have to be there. God can't wipe them away if they're not there. Now, I looked at the book of Revelation, and I find that there will come a time, according to chapter 21, verse 4, when there will be no more tears. Hallelujah. There will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? Amen. Amen. I'm excited about that. But we realize just by reading these three texts tonight that there has to be tears in heaven. So I want to preach to you tonight about instances where there's tears in heaven. Go back with me to the first one, if you would, in Revelation chapter number 5, verses 1 through 5. We read together. John is weeping here because he is afraid that no one is worthy to open the book. He sees the book in the hand of God the Father on the throne. And he sees that book and nobody is able or worthy to open the book. And John is scared. He's afraid. What's going on? Who's going to be able to open the book? And when he begins to weep in verse number 4, all of a sudden in verse number 5, one of the 24 elders said unto him, Weep not. Don't worry about it. Because there is somebody that is able, that is worthy to open the book. Who is the one that is worthy? Brother Doug, he said, it is the Lamb. Hallelujah. It is the Lamb. It is Jesus Christ that is worthy and is able to open the book. Hallelujah. He said, don't weep about it because the Lamb is able. He has the power. He has the worth. He has the ability to open the book. And he watched the Lamb go forward and take the book out of God the Father's hand. And then the book of Revelation is all about that unsealing and opening up of the book. Let me tell you, the Lamb is still able to do it. Hallelujah. I love the Lamb. Don't you? Amen. But now let's look at this second one. Because I don't have uh, 13 sermons to preach to you tonight. Or time to preach 13 sermons. So let's look at the second one. I want to look at this one a little more in detail. Chapter 7, or chapter 5, deals with, excuse me, I am confused. Chapter 7, let me turn the page of my Bible. Chapter 7 deals with the second occurrence of tears in heaven. We find the tears in verse 17. But I want to look at the context of the scripture and give you a picture of what's going on. First, you have to understand this. There is two scenes that are going on at the same time here. Remember that after the rapture takes place of the church, in the book of Revelation, there are times that you see things that are going on in the heavens. You see the judgment seat of Christ. You see the marriage supper of the Lamb. All that's going on on that level. But then in the book of Revelation also, you find that there are things that are going on on earth. Amen. The tribulation is happening here for all those that miss the rapture. And so there are two lines of activity that are going on. And you need to understand that. Revelation chapter number 7 is like a parenthesis in the middle of the book where God just stops everything and says, let me tell you about this that is going on. Amen. I want you to understand here, hallelujah, that the first scene that's unfolding in heaven is the the judgment seat of Christ. You read about in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 9, even where it begins to talk about every one of us will appear at the great judgment seat of Christ and we will give account for the works that we have done in the flesh, whether they are good or they are bad. Amen. Even though our sins are dealt with, we are still going to go to judgment. It is not a judgment of whether we are saved or not, 
that's already determined because we've gone in the rapture and we're in heaven. But it is a judgment of our works. We're going to talk about that tonight. But then on earth, there's something else going on. And it is that great tribulation. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8 reveals to us the 144,000 Jewish evangelists even that are sealed by God. They're also discussed in chapter 14. You can read about them later on. It's a very uh, encouraging read about those 144,000 evangelists that win souls for God. Even But first of all, I want you to look with me in chapter 7, verse number 4, and realize that they are called out. They are specifically named of who they are. Revelation chapter 7, verse number 4, it said this, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So who are they? They're Jews that are saved, and God makes them evangelists and soul winners during the tribulation, and they win souls to God. Hallelujah. Amen. They are specifically named. The Bible said, if you read chapter 7, there are 12,000 taken out of every 12 tribe of Israel. Amen. 144,000. Praise God. Amen. So now that tells me something, Brother Seville. Amen. That tells me that, first of all, they are not the Seventh-day Adventist. Right. Amen. Seventh-day Adventists say there's 144,000 that are sealed, and that's them. <laughs> it's nobody else. But then, Brother Doug, when they had 144,000 and one, they had to figure out who the other one could be. <laughs> yeah. So they said, well, that don't work. So now they've got a whole new explanation about the Bible. They had to change it when they figured out they were wrong. But I'll tell you who else it's not. It's not the Jehovah's Witness. The Jehovah's Witnesses think it's them. It's not them. The Bible is very plain. He said they were 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. If you read Revelation 14, you'll find out more about it. But there are literally 144,000 Jewish men who get saved and preach the glorious gospel of the Lamb, hallelujah, all the way through the tribulation. Praise God. So they're specifically named. But then we find that they are sealed. Verse 3 and verse 4 said that the angel steps out and said, stop everything. We've got to seal these 144,000. Now we don't know what the seal is. It could be a mark on their head. It could be that they're sealed by the Spirit. We don't know. We're not told what it is. But we do know that we are sealed by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. So they may be sealed by the Spirit of God. And we know that a seal guarantees a ownership and a preservation because we are sealed under the day of redemption with the Spirit of God. Amen. We don't have to backslide. But we can be kept by God through everything we go through. Amen. You read about these men that are preaching the gospel and the Antichrist could not hurt them. He could not kill them. He could not stop them because they were sealed by the Spirit of God. I want to tell you something. If you're sealed by the Spirit of God, amen, the devil can't stop you either. The devil can't kill you either. Amen. The devil can't keep you from sharing the gospel either. Oh, thank God for the seal of the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. But then notice the third thing in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 7. You find another one here. It said, After this I beheld a low great multitude which no man could number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Notice. They're specifically named, they're sealed, but then notice that they're soul winners. And they win a number that cannot be numbered. Praise God. Oh, what a vast number of souls that are going to be saved Praise in God. the tribulation. Praise God. Amen. But then look at their very nationalities. Verse 9, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every nation, red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in His sight. Amen. And he's going to win souls to himself. I want you to notice how they're saved in the tribulation. They're saved by the blood of the Lamb. Can I tell you something? It's always the blood of the Lamb. There is no other way to be saved but by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. They begin to worship here in this chapter. 
Amen. 144,000 clothed in white robes. And they begin to worship with palms in their hand. Then in verse number 11, they're joined by all the angels that are around them. Then they're joined by the 24 elders, which represent the church that has been raptured out. Then the four beasts join them in worship. And there is a great concert of praise to the Lamb that sits on the throne of God. Hallelujah. Amen. All of them are worshiping the God that saved them by His own blood. Amen. Friend, that's what heaven is going to be. Amen. When it all wraps up, the saints of God that have been raptured out, that's you and me, if we're saved, when the rapture takes place, we'll go to heaven. Amen. Then all those that die in the tribulation, amen, and give their life for their own salvation, amen, denying themselves under the death, amen, we're all going to get together in heaven and worship the Lamb that saved us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let me move quickly on through this. I want you to notice, and here, here is, I, I, there's so much more I could tell you about those 144,000 and the saints that are saved, but I'm going to skip over that. But I want you to understand why, who is it that is weeping here in Revelation 7? We see three groups, the 24 elders. Lord help me. I don't have time to get into all this. The 24 elders represent the church that have been raptured out. The 144,000 are the evangelists that have won souls. Then there's an innumerable number. They're all worshiping God here. But when you get to verse 17, it said that God wipes away all tears from their eyes. Pastor Seville, who's he talking about? Is he talking about the 144,000 that were mistreated and attacked by the Antichrist? Or is he talking about those souls that were saved and had to give their life in order to be saved? They had to have their uh, head taken off. They had to give their life in order to be saved. Is he talking about them? Or is he talking about the 24 elders, the church that has been taken in the rapture? I'll tell you who I think he's talking about. Every one of them. Right, right. They're all weeping here. And I want to show you why they're weeping. If the Lord would help me right here to preach to you, I want to show you why are the 24 elders, the church, weeping here. Amen. This is the reason. Remember what I said? While it's on, on in heaven, amen, the judgment seat of Christ is going on. And on earth, down here, the tribulation is going on. Why in the world are we, Brother Justin, weeping up there in heaven? Why would there be tears? Because there is a judgment judgment seat of Christ that is going on. And while we are in heaven, we're saved. But we are giving account for everything that we've done on earth. Everything that we have done since we got saved, we're giving an account for it. Every word that we spoke, every action that we did, every attitude that we displayed, every soul that we tried to win, we're giving an account for that. And God said that when He sees all of that, He's going to burn it up with fervent heat. He's going to see if it will stand the test of fire. Oh God. And we may see all of our works, all of our labor, everything we've done all burn up when it's a pile of ashes at our feet. And we have no crown to cast before our Lord. Amen. And that is why we will weep. When we're in heaven, and our works are tried by fire. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said they're either going to be wood, hay, and stubble and be burnt up, or they're going to be gold and silver and precious stones, and they're going to last and stand the test of the fire. And then I believe God's going to gather all of that up. He's going to make it into a crown and put it on our head and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And when we begin to worship the Lamb, the Bible said that we'll take our crowns and cast them at the feet of the Lamb that was slain for us. And we'll be able to worship. But friend, if all of our works, all of our deeds, everything that we've ever done is burnt up and we have nothing to be made into a crown, can you imagine how we will weep when we find out everything we could have done for God and we did not do it? When we find out everything we should have done for God and we did not do it? Every soul that we should have witnessed to, every time we could have prayed, every time This is 
is where it got along at church because I wanted to preach to the church why or what is it that's judged at that judgment. I'm going to give them to you quickly and I'm going to give you scriptures. There's 11 things. If you want to get a CD later on, you read this and study it out. It'll challenge your heart. First thing you're going to be judged by, we're going to be judged for, is how we treat other believers. Matthew chapter number 10, verse 41 and 42. You're going to stand before God, every one of us that are Christians. We're going to stand before God on that judgment day. And He's going to judge us for how we have treated every other Christian in the world. He specifically mentions preachers, the righteous person, and the young, the new convert or children. Let me tell you how you treat your pastor and every man of God that you come in contact with in your life. God's going to judge you for that at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Amen. How you treat holy people, good Christians, the Bible calls them righteous men. How you treat other people that you go to church with, other Christians, you treat them with a good attitude and a good spirit, God's going to give you a crown for that. But if you treat them bad, you treat them with disdain, you gossip and slander, talk about them, run them down, God's going to burn that up. And you're not going to have a crown to give. New converts and children, oh God, Please don't do anything to hinder a new convert. Please don't do anything to make a child have a sour taste in their mouth about Christ. Because how you do with them is going to be judged on judgment day. And when you stand before the throne of God, He's going to burn it all up with fire. And if it goes away to ash, you have nothing. But if it lasts that test, you'll have a crown of rejoicing in heaven. God help us how we treat other believers. Secondly, how we exercise authority that we're given in our life. Hebrews chapter 13, James chapter 3, verse number 1. Both of those tell us we're going to be judged about how we handle authority. That doesn't matter if it's a preacher, a pastor, a parent, a school principal, a policeman, everybody. If you have authority in your life, God's going to call you into judgment for how you do that. God help us. Amen. How we use our God-given talents. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 6. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Peter chapter 4. Every one of them tell us that we are going to be judged for how we use the gifts and talents that God has. Listen to me. If God gave you a talent, use it for the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what it is. If God gave you the talent to be an electrician, Use it for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. You say, well, Brother Brim, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a singer. I'm not a musician. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I can't do anything for God. Amen. Let me tell you an old Greek word like that. Hogwash. Everybody has a talent you can use for God. Yes. Amen. Brother, every time you twist a wrench, you're twisting it for God. You might be retired now. Amen. You just watch somebody else twist your wrenches. Amen. That's all right. Amen. Every time you do whatever you do for your life, live it, do it for God. Amen. You're going to give an account for that. How we use our money, number four. Oh, Brother Brim, don't meddle with that now. But if we pay our tithes or not, we're going to be judged for that. Offerings, giving to missions, everything we give, everything we do with our money. If you take the money God gives to you, oh boy, I feel like a pastor now. I need to be careful. If you take the money God gives you and you use it for wicked, sinful things, God's going to judge you for that. Right. You may never sin with that money, but if you allow it to go to sinful things, you hear Brother Brigham, you're going to be called an account for that. First right. Timothy chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we talk about that. Number five, how we suffer in our trouble and tribulation. How do we handle the hard times that we go through in life? There's so many verses for that. Number six, how we spend our time. If I really, if I really wanted to embarrass you, J. Oswald Sanders said this. He said, if I want to embarrass any man, I can simply ask him this. How much time did you spend in prayer today? It would embarrass us, wouldn't it? Because we have time for everything else. But we can't find time to pray and read our Bible. We're going to give account for it. 
Number seven. You see why we'd be weeping in heaven? Can you understand a little better now? Number seven. How we run the race that God has set out before us. First Corinthians chapter 9. Run the race with patience. Run the race that you may obtain. Hallelujah. Number eight. How many souls we witnessed to and how many we won to Christ. Church, you're going to give account for that. Right. Let me give you a story. Every Sunday morning at our church, we take up an account of contacts. That does not mean how many contacts you have here. But how many people did you invite to church this week? It's amazing, Brother Seville, when you have 60 people that invite seven. It's embarrassing. So you know what I've tried to do? I try to invite people all the time to church because I, as a pastor, Brother Seville, I want to set an example. Amen. Not bragging on Brim. No, I'm just telling you. I want to set an example because I want my church to realize it's important. Invite people to church. Tell them about Jesus. Witness to them. If you love your church, tell them to come to it. There's something good going on. Amen. We ought to tell everybody we can about Jesus. He's the best thing they could ever find. Amen. If we had the answer to cancer, wouldn't you want somebody to tell it? Yes. Yeah. If we had the answer to glaucoma of the eye or leukemia of the blood, wouldn't you want somebody to tell it? Yes. Amen. If we knew the answer to heart disease, we'd want everybody to know it. We know something better than that. Amen. We're going to be called an account before God about how many souls we've witnessed to and what we have done for Christ. Oh God, don't let us stand before the throne of God and weep in shame because we did not have time to invite somebody to go to church. Amen. Number nine, how we handle the flesh and temptation. We're going to give account for that. Right. Every time you give in or every time you overcome, you're getting another reward for overcoming. Praise God. Number 10, whether or not we're looking forward to the rapture. <laughs> oh, Lord. Did you think that Jesus might come today? Amen. Number 11, how faithful we are to God's Word and God's church. You know your favorite thing in the world ought to be church? Your life ought to revolve around church. Go back to the Old Testament and find it out. When they set up the temple, the tabernacle rather, in the wilderness, they set their life up around it. It was the center of their life. Today we live the total opposite. And when we set our life and church falls way out here somewhere, if I can fit it in. Amen. But oh, I want to love the church. Amen. Why? Because Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. He is my pattern, my example. I'm going to give an account when I stand before God. According to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, 3, and 4, and 2 Timothy chapter 4 and Acts chapter 20, I'm going to give an account for how I handle the church. Amen. I want to love the church. I want to love God's Word. I want to love it with all my heart because I'm going to stand before God and give an account. Amen. Now church, on those 11 things, would you weep if you were standing before God tomorrow? I guarantee you that every one of us would weep, including me. Because, Brother Doug, we all see where we could do better. So what am I going to do, Brother Brim? Let's do better about every one of them. Look at this last one. You guys realize you're getting 13 messages in about 30 minutes. <laughs> Praise God. Before I go to this last one, let me read something I read to you, church. There will be many, many, many tears shed at the judgment seat of Christ. When we see what we could have done for Christ, when we see what type of children we could have raised, when we see what kind of church we could have had, I said at Parker Hill Holiness Church, but let me say, when you see what kind of church you could have had at Lycan's Miracle Revival Church, right. when you see the souls you could have won, when you see the prayer time that we totally wasted, when we see what God could have done with our talent, our abilities, and our money, but we just wouldn't give it to Him, there's going to be tears in 
God help us. But now let's go to Revelation chapter number 21. Let's look at this last account. Chapter 21 is the story of the new heaven, the new earth coming down out of heaven. According to verse 5 and 6, all things are made new. That's all in Revelation 21. So why are people in heaven crying in Revelation chapter 21 verse number 4? This is the children of God, the saints of God, and brother, they're weeping in heaven. Why? When I began to study about it, pray about it, this is what, this is what I saw. In Revelation 20, there's another judgment. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And there, all of the sinners, the lost people, are judged. Satan is going to be judged in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Souls that rebel against God at the end of the millennial reign will be judged there and cast into hell. They will be cast into the lake of fire with the devil, with the antichrist, with the beast. They will be cast into hell forever and ever and ever, never to get out. It is the final resting place for every soul that is denied and rejected Jesus Christ. You say, well, Brother Brent, why are we weeping about that? We've got to go to heaven. But we, as the saints of God, are going to stand there and watch that judgment. My God. We're going to watch the devil be judged, bound, and cast into the pit. We're going to watch all of that. And then, Lord, help me right here. We're going to watch our loved ones that we could have won, that we could have had an impact on, that we could have told them about Jesus Christ. That we could have got them to come to church with us. That we could have exerted influence on their life and said, you need to get saved. Jesus is coming. And if you're not right, you're going to go to a devil's hell for all of eternity. And Pastor, I submit to you tonight that when we stand there and we watch all those souls that are judged and then they are thrown into the lake of fire that burneth forever, I tell you, there will be tears in heaven. Yes, there will. We will cry. Oh, my. You say, Brother Brim, are we really going to watch that? Yes, yes, we are. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 41. Here's what it said. It said, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonah and the holy greater than Jonah is here. He said, the men of Jonah, that repent, or Nineveh, that repented when Jonah preached to them, they're going to be watching that judgment. And every one of them are going to see it all. And they're going to say, yes, you should have repented. I did. Friend, let me tell you, we're going to see it all. Jesus. How heartbreaking will it be to watch loved ones be thrown into hell with the devil? said, Brother Brim, there will be no tears in heaven. Oh, yes, there will. When we watch our loved ones go to hell for eternity, there's going to be weeping in heaven. Amen. Brother Brim, is there any good news in this message? Yes, there is. At the end of verse number 4, Revelation 21, God said, all right, now listen, all, all the crying's over. And I don't know if God does it or not. I don't know exactly how God will do it. Amen. But God's going to take and He's going to wipe away all tears. Well, Doug, he said He's going to wipe them away. To say, okay, I know your heart was broken about everything you could have done for God. I know your heart was broken about lost loved ones that went to hell for eternity. He said, but now it's time to no more tears. Dry them up. Amen. I'm going to tell you there will be encouragement in heaven. Heaven will be good. Heaven will be great. But when we watch those judgments, we're going to cry. Now, Brother Brim, how can we avoid those tears? How can we avoid all that weeping in heaven? I'm going to tell you how. Those 11 things that I mentioned, if you didn't get them, you can get notes after work. You can listen to the CD later on. But you go back and examine your life in the light of every one of those things. And I tell you that if you'll live to the best of your ability in every one of those areas, you can minimize your tears. Brother Brim, how can I keep from weeping over lost loved ones that are going to hell? I'll tell you how. Do everything you can right now to win them. Yes. Yes. 
Pastor, if we really had a revival of having no tears in heaven, you couldn't fit everybody in this church because we'd be making souls left and right. God, stir our hearts about what we're doing for Christ. God, stir our hearts about our lost loved ones that are going to hell that we can have an influence on. Listen to this and I'm done. The old songwriter said it like this. Only one life so soon will be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So give to Jesus all your days. It's the only life that pays. When you recall, you have but one life. Everything you're doing right now, do it for Christ. Yes. Yes. Will there be tears of heaven? Yes. But I believe if we work harder, we can minimize our tears. Yes. Would you stand with me all over the house, Heavenly Father? I pray tonight that your spirit would challenge every man, every woman, every young person in this building. Lord, everybody that has the power to understand what I preach to us tonight, I pray that you would put it in our hearts and let it begin to bring forth fruit. Lord, let us examine ourselves in the light of eternity. Because we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Lord, we're going to be judged for everything we've done, whether good or bad. Oh God, I want to do my best for your kingdom. Lord, I want to do my best to win souls and not have to watch them be cast into hell for all of eternity. Would you stir our hearts tonight, God? Would you stir our hearts tonight, God? That we do more for the kingdom of God. Lord, you did so much for us. Can we not do our best for you? Stir this church, Lord. Stir it. Let every heart, every soul have a revival of praying, reading, fasting, witnessing, giving, being faithful, working and laboring for the kingdom of God. Let every heart here be stirred about tears at that great white throne judgment. Oh, Lord, and let us go to our family, our loved ones, our friends, our neighbors, and tell them about Jesus, and tell them they need to be in church, and tell them Jesus loves them and died for them, that they can be saved. Yes. So we won't have as many tears in heaven. In Jesus' precious name, I pray it. Can I open this altar tonight? Is there anybody in this building that while I'm preaching, you realize I can do better for the kingdom of God? My God did so much for me. My Jesus gave his all on Calvary. Couldn't I do a little better for him? Is there somebody in this building that was stirred tonight? I want to do better for Jesus. I want to do better to win souls. I want to do better. This altar is open for you if you'd like to do better. If you'd like to make sure that you wouldn't have those kind of tears in heaven, I'm opening this altar for you right now. God, I pray you stir every heart in this building about our giving, our living, our praying, our fasting, our faithfulness, our love for church, our ardent looking for the second coming of Christ, the return of Jesus. Lord, would you stir our hearts about souls? Would you stir us about men and women that are lost and going to hell? Would you stir us about our family members that are not saved? Lord, don't let us wait until they're at death's door and then get stirred, but let us be stirred now. I don't want to watch them thrown in hell, God. I want to have them standing with me in heaven, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Stir us tonight, oh God. Give this church a revival of soul winning. Give it a revival of giving. A revival of praying, a revival of fasting, a revival of Bible reading, a revival of being witnesses for Jesus Christ, a revival of loving the church, treating other Christians better than we've ever treated them, having a heart for the kingdom of God. Lord, how are we using our time? Challenge us about those things tonight, God. How could we waste our time in so many other areas that we don't even have time for Jesus? 
We're too busy to read or pray. Too busy to go to church. God, I pray you stir our hearts tonight. I don't want to just be lost in tears in heaven. Hallelujah. 